I would like to start, if you don't mind, by <clears throat> reminding ourselves of the uh, titles, the accolades mentioned by Shoghi Effendi in his writings about the American Baha'i community. <clears throat> A community, he wrote, which was the first to awaken to the call of the new day in the Western world. A community which was the first to champion the cause of the oppressed and to generously contribute to the alleviation of the sufferings of the needy and the persecuted among the followers of Baha'u'llah. A community whose members are regarded as the spiritual descendants of the dawn breakers of our heroic age. Again, a community which was chosen to be the chief repository of the immortal tablets of Abdul Baha's divine plan, and whose members are considered as the chief executors of that mandate, as the champion builders of a divinely conceived administrative order, as the standard bearers of the all conquering army of the Lord of Hosts and as the torch bearers of a future divinely inspired world civilization. These titles to me span over the formative age and extend into the golden age. Such are the possibilities, the capacities that Sugar Fendi saw in this blessed community. As I see a number of Persians, uh, especially when I, I attended the two summer schools, I saw that there were many, many Persians at these summer schools. I thought I should uh, read to you something that Shoghi Effendi wrote, indicating the relationship <coughs> of the American Baha'i community to Iran. This is in Baha'i administration in the very early years of his ministry. Our oppressed and downtrodden brethren in Persia will witness the signs of their promised redemption, which as foretold by Abdul Baha, must first be made manifest through the efforts of their brethren in that great freedom-loving Republic of the West. Their promised redemption, as foretold by Abdul Baha, will be first be made manifest through the efforts of their brethren in this country. He also <coughs> quoted for the American friends a passage from the writings of Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi did, <coughs> showing the link. This has not yet happened, but it will happen. Here is uh, this passage from a tablet of Abdul Baha revealed while he was incarcerated within the walls of the prison city of Akka, and he addressed it to the Baha'is of Khorasan in Iran. And Shoghi Effendi translated it for you and included it in one of his letters. These are the words of Abdul Baha. Er long. Er long means soon. It is one of those classical words that is not often used in ordinary English. Erlong, 
will your brethren from Europe and America journey to Persia. There, they will promote to an unprecedented degree the interests of art and industry. There, they will rear the institutions of true civilization. It's really remarkable. Promote the development of husbandry. Husbandry means agriculture. Of husbandry and trade. And assist in the spread of education. Assuredly, they will come. Assuredly, they will contribute in making the land of Iran the envy and the admiration of the peoples and nations of the world. That is what Abdul Baha foresaw. That is the promise he has given to the friends in Iran. The friends in Iran know this. Many of the friends, I remember many of the youth had memorized this because the original is in Persian. They memorized it. They studied English because they were awaiting the arrival of the Baha'is from, from the United States, from North America, as well as from Europe. So this is your destiny, beloved friends. <clears throat> however, however, I would like to read to you another passage which is in the form of a warning. You will excuse me, but I have to say that. <laughs> in one of his letters, he says that this has given what we write, read in the writings, has given a spiritual primacy to the American Baha'i community. But this primacy, <laughs> will be lost through neglect and apathy. Apathy means lack of enthusiasm. Will be lost through neglect and apathy. And he calls on the American friends not to allow themselves to lose this vital power in this primacy and its driving force. I'll leave you to meditate upon these thoughts expressed by Shoghi Effendi. You know, as you know, Baha'u'llah abolished professional clergy. This abolishing of the clergy, the professional clergy, has been anticipated, I believe, in the New Testament. In one of the parables of Jesus Christ, known as the parable of the Lord of the vineyard, and I'm sure you are all familiar with it. I'll summarize it for you. There was a vineyard and it had its owner, its Lord, and after a while, he saw that they were not sending him his share as owner and proprietor of the produce of the vineyard. So he sent one of his servants in order to receive this share. They sent him back empty-handed. So he sent the second servant the same thing happened. Then he sent a third servant, same thing. Finally, he thought, I will send my son, which was a reference to himself. And the husbandman or the farmers there <coughs> said, oh, what a wonderful opportunity. The heir has come. We will kill him and now we own the property after his death, the death of the father. 
Then at that point, Jesus stops his story and he says, what do you think the father is going to do? And then he answers himself. He says, the father will go himself. He will come himself to the vineyard. He will dismiss the farmers, the laborers. I think as, I far, as far as I remember, the word used by Jesus Christ as translated into English, he destroys the husbandman. <laughs> and he gives, now this is the point, and he gives the vineyard to others. Who the others are has not been identified by Jesus at all in the parable. So uh, he says he destroys them and he gives them to others. Now Baha'u'llah, yeah, in God Passes By, Shoghi Effendi explains on the, the section about the, the station of Baha'u'llah. He quotes from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Buddhist scripture, and so on, showing the station of Baha'u'llah, the fulfillment of the prophecies about Baha'u'llah. And then he mentions this parable of the vineyard. <clears throat> and he identifies the father with Baal, and of course the son with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so we are sure that this is definitely about Baal, because the interpreter has said so. <laughs> so who were the others? <laughs> Baal came, he is the father. What did he do about the vineyard? The vineyard is this planet. What did he do about that? Who were the others? When you read his writings, you see that he abolished professional clergy. What has he inst installed in its place? He has installed the administrative order, of course. But he has done something else because <clears throat> clergy were also involved in promoting the cause, in teaching the cause, in spreading the cause, their cause, whatever their cause was, and whatever religion. So who had this responsibility? Dear friends, he has placed this responsibility on you and me, on our shoulders. We are the new laborers, if he would accept us as such. So he has, on the one hand, placed this responsibility on the individuals. On another hand, he has created the administrative order. The individual, the institutions. This is a new concept. You don't find this in the writings of any of the previous manifestations that humanity uh, has seen, has witnessed. <clears throat> Shoghi Effendi makes it very clear in God Passes By. In his foreword to the book, Promised Days Come, not the introduction, the introduction was written by George Townsend, the foreword was written by him. In the foreword of God Passes By, he explains the evolution that has taken place in the community, in the Baha'i community. And <clears throat> he speaks about pilgrimage, how this was changing, how it's developed, and all the various aspects of the Baha'i community. Then he comes to the teachings. He says the teachings, first during the ministry of the Bab, were given to the followers but the teachings were, he, said, he uses the word rigid, deliberately rigid. During the ministry of Baha'u'llah, these teachings were liberalized and explained, uh, reformulated in a manner that would be consistent with the progressive world society. That was Baha'u'llah. 
during the ministry of Abdul Baha, these teachings were further elucidated, explained, and <clears throat> amplified. I think he uses the term. And then, after the passing of Abdul Baha, referring to his own ministry, it's very interesting how he summarizes what he had been doing up to the year 1944 when he wrote God Passes By. He says, the teachings were applied to individuals as well as to institutions. That's how he summarizes it. His entire mission up to 1944 was, and by, believe me, of course, if you study his, his ministry, to the very end of his life, that's what he did. He applied the teachings of Baha'u'llah to individuals as well as to institutions. Two lines. Do you know, I'm sure you do, that in the, during the ministry of Abdul Baha'u'llah, Many Baha'is continued to drink alcohol. They didn't realize that it was prohibited. They considered it to be a discouragement, not a prohibition. The question of membership in churches, there were many who were members of churches. In Islam, they continued, many of them, to think that they were still you know, Muslims, or Shia, or whatever, and Baha'is. Political positions, that was clarified by Shoghi Effendi. He applied it, he applied the teachings to individuals and made it clear, this is your, but it was not as clear, as concisely clear during the ministry of Abdul Baha, or the ministry of Baha'u'llah, the general. The, the, his teachings were scattered they had not been yet put together, codified, organized, universally explained. That's how it was during the ministry of Baha'u'llah, the ministry of Abdul Baha. Now, when Sugar Effendi came, <laughs> there was organization, organized application of the laws, the ordinances, the teachings. He explained all these things to the Baha'is. And the reason why I'm quoting this, because the distinction between individuals and, and institutions, how he explained in two different ways. For example, teaching. <laughs> teaching, of course, Abdul Baha'u'llah had spoken about teaching, and I will quote for you the passages. Abdul Baha had done the same thing. So that was for the individual, but now he took this this obligation to teach and applied it to institutions. <laughs> this was also in the writings of Baha'u'llah. There is a tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah called the Tablet of the House of Justice. It has not yet been translated. You, maybe you have read it in Persian or you have read a, an author, unauthorized translation of this tablet. One of the first duties, Baha'u'llah says in the tablet of the House of Justice. Of course, when he says House of Justice at that point, he does not mean only the universal House of Justice. He means the House of Justice on all its levels, on all three levels, local, national, international. The first duty, he says, is to organize the teaching work. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> when Shoghi Effendi became guardian in <clears throat> 1923, he enumerated the duties of local assemblies. Number one is to direct the teaching work, to organize, to organize it, to guide the friends, unify the friends in their activities, to consider the methods of teaching and apply them to the circumstances at each age, each time, each period. This is all in the writings in the writings of Baha'u'llah, in the writings of Shaghi Effendi. Number one, it's always number one, this teaching work. So this is what Shaghi Effendi did. It was there, it was implicit, it was not maybe forgotten, but he took all these things, classified them, 
categorized them, applied them, made them clear to us. I'll read to you now some of the statements made by Baha'u'llah to the individual. God hath prescribed unto everyone the duty of teaching his cause, everyone. Teach ye the cause of God, O people of Baha. For God hath prescribed unto everyone the duty of proclaiming his message and regarded it as the most meritorious of all deeds. It is incumbent upon everyone to teach his cause to the extent of his ability. And of course, this is not everything, just samplings of, on, on this subject. Abdul Baha. When the friends do not endeavor to spread the message, they will not witness the tokens of assistance and nor comprehend the divine mysteries. Wow, when I read that, I said to myself, oh God, divine assistance, you find many, many passages like that. That if, you don't, don't, if we don't deliver the message, we will not witness the divine assistance in Persian, ta'id, divine confirmation, the sustaining grace of Baha'u'llah, his guidance. We will not experience that. In order to experience that, we must teach. This is what Abdul Baha has said this several times and here in this tablet. But then he adds something else. He says, and comprehend the mysteries, the divine mysteries. Mysteries are concealed. Baha'u'llah says, immerse yourselves in the ocean of my utterance in order to discover the pearls of mystery, the mysteries, the pearls hidden in this ocean. So, all right, that's study. It's not reading, it is study. But here he says, there is another way for you to discover the mysteries. Teach the cause. <laughs> God will enable you to discover the mysteries concealed in his utterances. It's a wonderful thing that Abdul Baha said. Then there is this one. I'm sure you all know it by heart. In this day, every believer must, you know, there is a difference in English between must and should. It's not should, it is must. In this day, <laughs> you will forgive me, I raised my voice for no reason at all. Really. <laughs> In this day, every believer must concentrate his thoughts on teaching the faith. All loved ones of God, each one of the friends must teach at least one soul every year. This is everlasting glory. This is eternal grace. You know, I have a heart, a heart problem. This is true. I have to take special medicine every morning for my heart. Now, as I'm talking to you, as I get excited, <laughs> I may have a heart attack. <laughs> it will be a problem for the National Spiritual Assembly. <laughs> funeral, all the problems. <laughs> but I really mean this could be a reality uh, because I have this problem. But what will happen up there? I might be very lucky to see Abdul Baha from a distance. He will look at me, oh, Ali, you have come, come. <laughs> How old are you now? 92. All right, we will forget the first 15 years. You were a child. <laughs> 92, less 15, 77. You knew my instructions. You knew my, the letter I had written. You knew that must is not the same as should. <laughs> 
Tell me, do you have the list of the 70, or the, of the 77 people? Have you, do you have the names? What would be my answer? God knows I tell you how I feel. I really think that every one of us should think like that. If you are Baha'i, of the Baha'i family, anything above 15, see how many years that is. And he says, at least, at least, every year, one person. If you have accepted the faith yourself, God bless you, <clears throat> count from the year that you became a Baha'i. See how many years have passed. See how many Baha'is did you bring into the faith? This is what I want you to think about. Because God knows I think about it all the time. I worry about it all the time. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Shoghi Effendi, never let a day pass without teaching some soul, trusting to Baha'u'llah that the seed will grow. Shoghi Effendi, every day teach the course once, 365 days every year. This is not Ali speaking. This is Shoghi Effendi. Upon every participa participator in this concerted effort rests the spiritual obligation to make the mandate of teaching so vitally binding upon all, the all-pervading concern of his life. Let teaching his cause become the paramount and most urgent duty of every Baha'i. Let us make it the dominating passion of our lives. We have many passions. All right, fine. But you must have a dominating passion, <laughs> a passion which dominates over all the other passions. And that should be teaching the cause. Show you something. Listen to this. You must make a special point of praying ardently, notice ardently, not only for success in general, but that God may send S E and D to you the souls that are ready there are <clears throat> there are such souls in every city all must participate however humble their origin however limited their experience is closing doors for no excuses. I repeat, however humble their origin, however limited their experience, however restricted their means, however deficient their education, however pressing their cares, and preoccupations, however unfavorable the environment in which they live. <clears throat> the first guideline that Baha'u'llah has given us is to mix with people. He says, consort with <clears throat> all men, all people of Baha'u'llah in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. 
shall be offend the earth. Every laborer should, I feel, make it his chief concern to mix in a friendly manner with all sections of the population. The individual alone must manfully struggle against the natural inertia that weighs him down in his efforts <clears throat> to arise, to mix with men and women in all walks of life, and to win them over tactfully, lovingly, prayerfully, and persistently. Four adverbs, if I may repeat them. Tactfully, lovingly, prayerfully, and persistently to the faith he himself has espoused. Let him, let him attempt to devise such method, methods as association with clubs and societies interested in subjects akin to the teachings and ideas of his cause, such as temperance, morality, social welfare, religious and racial tolerance, or in principles of a social, cultural, humanitarian, charitable, or educational character. He's telling us, pushing us, mix, mix with people, to the extent that become members of these societies and clubs. Let him carefully consider every avenue of approach to capture, notice the stages, to capture the attention, comma, maintain the interest. These are not the same, there are two stages. Capture the attention, <laughs> maintain the interest, and deepen the faith of those whom he seeks to bring into the fold of his faith. So when it comes to the deepening after talking to receptive souls, finding receptive souls through prayer. <clears throat> of course, it, when I say through prayer, they will not come from heaven or from the sky. We have to meet them, find them. <laughs> through prayer, God will send them to us. He does not say, you will be guided to them. He has more trust in them than in us. <laughs> he will send them to you. But you have to mix. There is no time for me to give you examples, but I have a list of possibilities. Because Baha'u'llah says, when you encounter people who are ready, recite my verses to them. And I have a list of passages that I have selected that I found to be extremely helpful in my teaching work. And I wanted to give you the references. I'll just give you the references without reading them. It is first Arabic words, Arabic hidden words, number three, Arabic hidden words, number 12, and three lines from the tablet of Baha'u'llah to Nasr bin Shah that you find in Promised Days Come, page 40, beginning with the words, O King, I was but a man like others, asleep upon my couch, when lo, the breezes of the old glorious were wafted over me. Three lines. If you memorize these two hidden words, these three lines from the tablet of Baha'u'llah to Nasrid Nisha, my dear, as you are talking and quote the words of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah himself says, quote my words. Memorize them. It will help you in your teaching work. Because your words are your words, however sincere you are, but they are your words. What Baha'u'llah? It penetrates the hearts. It influences the souls. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that in his writings, Shobhi Effendi speaks about the parent-child relationship. In other words, 
now that you have attracted him, you have introduced him, you have probably invited him to your fireside at home, you have extended hospitality to him, you show love to him, then you guide him to enter into these core activities that the House of Justice has so kindly initiated and explained to us. You do all these things, but show your friendly. This parent-child relationship should not be disconnected. Keep it. In other words, that person that I'm now putting through this process, the institute process, is still my spiritual child. I am the father of that individual. I am the mother of that individual. This is not Ali speaking. This is surely a father-child, mother-child relationship. So we have to maintain this relationship until the very end. What is the end? He says the end is maturity of that child. So while he is having these classes and devotional meetings, and, uh, the, the, the Ruhi books and uh, all these activities, fine, devotional meetings, fine. But your relationship with your child should not be severed. Keep your contact with him. Show your love to him. Invite him again to your home. Be in contact with him. In that way, there will be less dropouts from this institute process. This parent-child relationship is so important. And where does it end? Sugar Friendly explains it. There is no time for me to read for to you all the passages. When you see that your child is independently teaching the course. Hands off. Mature has become mature. Independent. That's all right. So that is our Shoghi Effendi's explanation. Finally, I would like to quote for you this passage in one of his writings. <clears throat> this is from Baha'u'llah. If the individual believer be kindled with the fire of his love, if he forgetteth all created things, the words he uttereth shall set on fire them that hear him. So he's saying two things. He says that <clears throat> if you want to teach, you must have the love of God in your heart. But that's not enough. You should not only be a, not only a believer, but a lover. And not only a lover, but an ardent lover. But that's not enough. You have to create, to forget all created things. To me, friends, this means I have to forget myself also. I should not think I'm going to teach this guy. People are going to say, oh, Ali has taught this job. This job. Say, oh, Ali is a good teacher. I have not forgotten myself. I have not forgotten my ego. My ego has come in. If, if that is the influence of my ego that I'm teaching with this, per, with this in mind, with this objective in mind, there will be no influence on the hearts of the people that I'm teaching. But if I detach myself from myself, forget myself, overcome my ego, excuse me, tell my ego kindly to shut up, because the ego commands, orders, be quiet. And <clears throat> I can never uproot it. According to the text, it will be continued to be with me till the very end. When they bury my casket in the grave, that's when my ego will also go there in that casket. That will be the end. In the next world, I'm free. And we are all free from ego. No more tests as we have them here. No. But as long as we breathe, this ego is there. It even comes when you are teaching the course. So he says, forget everything. Have this love for God, for Baha'u'llah. Then when you speak, it has an effect. 
speak with detachment and speak with love. The Italians have a term when they, something is finished, they say, finita la musica. So I say, finita la musica. Thank you very much for listening to me.